I'd say, and it's probably as some of you are thinking right now, this is a little bit unusual, and this kind of whole interaction right now, and because it's unusual, I spent quite a lot of time preparing and planning because, well, you know, I didn't want to fuck it up, <laughs> basically. But I thought that initially that to kind of get things started, to get things going, I would come up with something, you know, speak freely and like on the spot on some kind of topic lightheartedly, but that hasn't really gone come on in, sorry. That hasn't really gone as planned, so I've just been kind of, as you see, standing here, walking around right now, really just been absolutely bewildered by the fact that you guys have all actually come here tonight. And and that so many of you have come. So that so I think I'm just gonna leave that aside for now. So there's an interesting mix of familiar and unfamiliar faces in the crowd tonight, and I can see that quite a lot of my friends here now are looking at me a little bit oddly, probably wondering what it is that they're doing sitting down there while I'm standing up here talking to them on a microphone, and you know, fair enough. But there's also some unfamiliar faces, and you know, I'd say that they're actually looking quite engaged and interested. <laughs> so, to get things going a bit, I should probably do a little bit of an introduction. So, my name is Lucian, and I'm a student here at Monash in my third year of study, completing a double major of chemistry and economics. And it's it's my hope that the students' perspective that I thus you know naturally possess will allow what we're going to talk about tonight to you know perhaps resonate more than if you're being lectured to by, you know, like a tenured academic, you know, one of your, one of your normal teachers. So, during my time here, I've had a chance to do a bit of thinking, you know, about, about just that, the time that we spend here, and it's relevant, it's not just to our, our current lives, but as a chapter in the entire story of our lives. Though, admittedly, that thinking has been more of a recent development. I spent my last two years here on residence at Farrah Hall with quite a few of the people here, actually. And as I would tell you, there isn't necessarily so much of a chance for thinking there at Halls, and more just for doing, specifically without thinking too hard on the consequences of what it is that you're doing, which I was an attitude that could certainly come in handy after particular nights out. <laughs> But eventually, I did start doing some thinking, and when I did, I noticed that the general attitude of my peers surrounding university and the time that they spent here was one that was lacking in enthusiasm, or at least how people felt about the time that they spent here was very ill-defined. You know, I rarely encountered much thought that extended far beyond them thinking that being here would, you know, would likely just help them to get a job. And you know, that's not necessarily a particularly exciting thought, really, on its own. So those people weren't particularly excited by that thought. And it seemed to me then that if something that as something as onerous as university couldn't at least fill you with a bit of excitement, then it probably wasn't worth doing in the first place. You know, they might have at least been uh, interested, or at least sort of interested in what it was that they're doing, you know, thinking. Oh, it, it's, it's okay, it's alright, it's not too bad, but... Hello, Jerry. But, <laughs> that's, not the same, that's not the same thing as being excitement. You know, excitement is what makes you actually want to do something. And to then also keep doing that thing. Hello. You're right. So, you know, excitement itself isn't necessarily what we're going to discuss tonight, but it, it can certainly be a byproduct of what we will discuss, and so it's something that's important to keep in mind. And so then that begs the question of why are we here tonight, and you know, why have I brought you all here? And there's, there's probably a few answers to that question, really, but there's a few things that I would at least like to focus on. And those, are, those things are as follows. So we're here to 
look at the way that we should observe and evaluate the things that we do, in particular by asking the question, why? We're here to approach the topic of self-development and explore the key themes contained within. Because, you know, self-development is it's something that's very fundamental, very important, especially, and you think that something very inherent as well in university, but it's also something that's not, I would say, precisely discussed in any fashion, though it should be. And so we're definitely going to have a look at that. And by doing these two things together, we're here to ultimately find more value to better justify the time that we spend here at university, which I think is something that some of us need. So we'll begin by exploring the fundamental, fundamental importance of the question, why? And we'll do so by looking at a model outlined by the ethnographer, Simon Sinek. Now, Sinek primarily uses this model here in relation to the idea of organisations within the business world. But what it presents can be just as relevantly employed here as it is within that realm. We can think of it as outlining the philosophical structure of the levels at which we can observe the nature of something. Like, let's say, our, our actions, or our thoughts, or our feelings, the things that we do. So then let's have a look at this model and break it down. So here we have three concentric rings, each with their own self-contained idea or concept or question. We have this example, this question of what, you know, what is it that you're doing? We have the question of why, oh sorry, of how. How do you do what it is that you're doing? And then we have this question or idea of why. Why do you do what it is that you're doing? You know, what is the inherent meaning or purpose behind your actions? So notice how these three ideas or questions are laid out in a concentric model, and not just three, and not just three separate ideas, because it's quite important in understanding the nature of this conceptualization itself and the relationship of these ideas to one another. Now I would argue that many of us begin our observation of something within this sphere of what, as it generally requires the the least level of um, mental analysis and can rely more on just like you know basic you know, intuition. So for example, if you were to ask me, you know, what are you doing right now? The answer to that question is simply, I'm talking to you all. And you know that's that's so that's true and it's entirely relevant to what it is that I'm doing. But it's a very it's a very simple answer that comes from what is really just a simple question. And simple answers only give us so much to work with. And so we want more than a simple answer. We want a complicated one. One which can be properly explored and offer the most insight on, let's say, the nature of something. And as is often the case, a simple answer rests upon and is supported by a complicated one. And you know, you can't, I'd say in just about every situation, you can't come up with a good, simple answer to something if you don't first understand the complicated one behind it. So if we're going to look for a complicated answer, then we may have to search elsewhere within this model. And, and I'm going to ignore the, the how aspect of this for now, as it mostly kind of just acts as a facilitation between these questions of what and why. And so then that leaves us with this question of why. And this here is where we want to focus our, our aim. For example, if you were to ask me now, why are you talking to us? The answer to that question suddenly contains reasoning and truths and a greater insight to the nature of this event you know, as a whole. And we want these things because they allow us to understand what it is that we're being presented with or, or feeling or experiencing. And once we understand something, you know, once we know it, we can then begin to to properly appreciate it, or to, to do something about it, or to navigate around it you know, entirely, that's what's necessary. And that is sometimes the case. So what we're doing here with this model, essentially, is we're outlining the, or highlighting the fundamental importance of asking the question why when trying to, as I keep saying, understand the nature of something. And you know, this can be in just about any context. You know, asking why 
why is that person behaving the way that they are? Why am I feeling the way that I am? Why have I been thinking the way that I have been? You know, science, the realm of fundamental investigative thought, revolves around the asking of this question, why? Like, for example, you know, why is the, why is the earth round? Why should one plus one equal two? And quite famously, you know, why does an apple fall from a tree? It was the it was the asking of questions such as these that led to the, the knowledge and understanding necessary to build the previously unimaginable world that we currently live in today. And you know, in light of this fact, it seems reasonable to suggest that only by asking questions of ourselves can we begin to build our own worlds in concordance you know, with those around us. So an important question that we might ask ourselves related to our time here at university is this why am I not doing well in this unit? And you know this is a question that I had to ask myself a couple of times last semester after after a certain mid semester test, which is you now I'm something sure something we can all relate to at some point. So then so there's there could be a few answers to that question and they could look like this. It's hard, and I don't know what I'm doing, and I don't enjoy it. And so then you can break that down. And it's like, so why is it hard? It's hard because you don't know what you're doing. Well, why don't you know what you're doing? Why don't you know what you're doing? You don't know what you're doing because you haven't taken the time to properly learn and understand the content. Well, why haven't you done that? Well, you haven't done that because, let's say, you're too busy playing video games. <laughs> you're too busy browsing social media and you're going on too many nights out. You know, you're just procrastinating in general. You know, you avoid allocating the time that this subject that you've chosen demands. Or maybe even you're you're too busy being consumed by personal issues which you refuse to address properly or to simply let go of entirely. And so they consume your mental space and, and corrupt your productivity, which I think is something that likely occurs more than you know, you might think. And see, but what we've just done there by exploring that question is in that way is we've, we've disseminated the issue, which means it can then be addressed at each constituent level to see where the real problem lies. And, see, once, and once you know where the real problem lies, you can then target it and do something about it if that's genuinely what it is that you want to do. And you know, if you don't, the thing is, is that if you don't follow a process or something along these lines when trying to solve a problem or come up with a solution to something, you're likely to just end up resulting in an answer that simply, simply meets your expectations or appears to be just self-evident, self which likely isn't actually going to end up being a very good answer after all. So the driving thesis behind, let's say, this question and that thought that the thought that we're just we're looking at is that asking why can lead you through better knowledge and understanding to greater truths about the world as it unfolds around you and the people in it, which then allows you to operate more productively and efficiently as you go about life. But of course, the harder the question, or let's say the harder the the more complicated the context or the scenario that you're looking at, the harder it is to explore the question that's contained within. And for many of us, the hardest questions for us to ask are of ourselves. And so we don't, or barring that, we've never even really thought to, to begin with. And what that does is it leaves us missing a, a clearly articulated, self-articulated why for, let's say, our current actions and existence, from which we can, which we use to center ourselves and then direct ourselves in the, in, and point ourselves in the direction which we wish to go in the future so that we're not just living in a, we're not just living with uncertainty about what it is that we're doing now and where we might be going. So in light of that fact, an important question that we might ask ourselves or each other is why am I or why are you at university. 
And now I would argue, or I'd say that many of you would begin to answer, or at least some of you would begin to answer that question like this. The reason why I'm at university is to get a degree. And you know, that doesn't strike me as a particularly good answer, and there's, there's a few reasons for this. Because firstly, that sounds more like a what than a why. What you're doing at university is getting a degree. And secondly, it's, it's an answer that lacks in substance. You know, university is a significant undertaking of no small importance to our current, our, our current and our future lives. You know, it should be more than just a, a degree, the idea of a degree. And for many of us, it actually needs to be. Because the, the disconnected idea of a degree and what that maybe has to offer you after three or four or five or even more years of hardship isn't enough to justify the load that it forces you to bear along the way, which is why so many of us just end up dropping out and all we have to show for it is our debt. But what we can do is, is we can look at this question using Synax model and that, that mental framework that we just previously explored and to see, what we, to see what we can come up with. And we can do that now. So I would argue that the, the theme of university has become the what. The degree that supposedly allows you to enter the real world and follow the path of your choosing. The how, the how is then the, the units and the study. And this is where things can become difficult if you don't have a strong why to, to rest upon. Because this how requires a high level of effort and, and commitment to perform to what we describe as a high standard to which we measure our abilities and for many of us as well, our, our inherent self-worth. Because you know, we're young and as of yet we have little <coughs> little with which to measure ourselves against, like to, to show to the outside world, to show what we're made of. And so we, can, we use our grades instead to do that, which isn't necessarily the best thing if you're not giving yourself, let's say, the best opportunities or tools possible to actually <coughs> do well. And so essentially what you do is, you, in, your, in, your, in your own way, you set yourself up for failure. So then now we must find our why answer to this question, the why portion of this model. And in saying this, you know, each and every one of you must find the model, the why that best fits you. But that can, that can take a while. So for the time being, however, there are certain fundamental ideas approachable to each and every one of us, which we can use to explore and potentially integrate within the creation of our own why. And if nothing else, they can simply act as a, a reference point or a starting point for the development of your own personal philosophies. So the following slide was developed by a unit coordinator here at Monash. A very insightful and thoughtful a very insightful and thoughtful man by the name of Jason Chu, who is actually here tonight with us in the back row there. So, oh, never mind. so Jason has uh, Jason has employed much of the ideas that we're talking about here tonight within his own life and career to to great benefit. Or so he's told me in the past. And it was actually the presentation of this slide to me within his class at the start of last semester that essentially led to us all being here to begin with. So as you can see, Jason himself posits this question of why are you at university and proposes some ideas or, let's say, a, a value proposition from which to work with, which we will use now to know. So here we have two main ideas to work with to help develop our, our why for why we're at university. We have this idea of intellectual maturity and the idea of emotional maturity. And these ideas are immensely relevant to the individual. And by that I mean everyone. They're universally possessed characteristics of self. Everyone possesses these characteristics to some degree. And on some level at least, the extent to which you've developed these properties within yourself runs I would say parallel to the quality and maturity of your character as measured not just by others 
but by yourself as well. So then why are these things important? So as the slides suggest, intellectual maturity allows you, and its development, allows you to apply thinking that is rational and scientific and evidence-based and creative and critical, which is a particularly important point, I would say, so I'd like to explore it briefly. So I know that many of us here like to give art students a hard time, simply for being art students. And you know, fair enough, to a degree. But there's something that they get you to do in arts, which you don't see so much of in other degrees, other faculties, I would say. And that is the process of writing, in particular, creative and contemplative writing. And what you're doing in this process, essentially, is you're laying down your thoughts in a manner that is structured and cohesive and intelligible. Usually with the purpose of exploring an, uh, an idea or an argument or a discussion. And what that does, what that writing does is it reflects back in those, it reflects those written words back into your own mind, which means you can then verbally articulate them as if you'd just written them at any point in time, which is that essentially means that you, com you can communicate yourself, which makes you an effective person in the moment. You know, for example, how many times has someone here been in, in a conversation or been having a discussion or an argument and they've had something that they've wanted to say, something that they felt was important to say, that, that, that you know, it was, it, was, it was gripping them, but they just, they didn't know how to say it. They didn't even know exactly what it is that they wanted to say. It was more just like a feeling of what it was that they wanted to say. See, what, what critical thinking does through the process of writing is it allows you to know what it is that you actually want to say and to then say it, which is something that is, is, is an incredibly important skill. Being verbally, verbally articulate is, is something that is quite rare, I would say. And so the importance of this aspect, I would say, overall, of this intellectual maturity is that it allows you to, de to its development allows you to develop open-mindedness, which in a world of incredible content and information and misinformation, allows you to disseminate truth from the subjective and to then appreciate the reality of objectivity as it makes itself known. And so then we have this aspect of intellectual maturity, so emotional maturity to explore. So the development of emotional maturity allows you to develop um, productive habits of integrity and discipline, you know, good work ethic, the ability to handle criticism <coughs> and failure and to be self-reflective. And there again is another particularly important point. Because if you can't be self-reflective, then you're simply destined to keep making the same mistakes that you always have and to never learn what it is that you've done well in, in the past and to then extrapolate that information out to the present to then inform you on how to act in the future so that you keep doing those things well or you even do them better. And a well-developed emotional framework is instrumental in retaining stability and the ability to remain receptive to positive stimulus, whilst also being able to address negative, to calmly address negative stimulus as it presents itself, which then allows us to think clearly and rationally, which again aids in our, the development of our intellectual maturity. And so once you do these things, once you have these things, you can then become receptive to wisdom as it makes itself known, whatever that might be. And to not only be receptive to wisdom, but to then generate your own, which I think is it's an important point of, let's say, growing up and becoming an adult, is learning to develop your own personal wisdoms about the world. And you know, as it turns out, university just happens to be the perfect place to propagate these aspects within ourselves. You know, where the only way that we grow and change and develop is through Stimulus, which can just be thought of as, as, as experience. And here at university, we're constantly exposed to new experience, or at least we have the opportunity to be. You know, we're faced with new modes of thought with each unit that we take, forcing us to traverse 
mental pathways previously left unexplored, were challenged both intellectually and emotionally during our time here, and then forced to grow by meeting that challenge. We have the opportunity to engage with a, you know, a diverse range of people, to form new relationships, and to better understand and integrate ourselves within social dynamics. And then, of course, there's anything and everything extracurricular that university itself helps facilitate, like, you know, like halls, for example. Halls, in essence, is just one large university facilitated extracurricular activity that just so happens to be your entire lifestyle, which is why it's so tiring and eventually, <clears throat> as I'm sure a lot of the people here could attest to, just have to get out of there. You can only stay there for so long. So I'll give you an idea on how on how I view university using this this framework of what and why that we've just been exploring for the past 20 or so minutes. So in terms of what I'm doing at university, what I'm doing is performing a practice in productivity across a range of fields. Everything that is required to go into that productivity, like let's say that integrity and discipline and critical thinking and the ability to uh, handle criticism and failure and to be self-reflective, all of that, and then everything that comes out of that productivity and all the potential for growth and change and positive development that that possesses is the reason behind why I'm here to begin with. And you know, you know, this can be hard and it's easy for us to become, to become disengaged or cynical through hardship, but it's important to remember that though painful things like failure and disappointment are still essential ingredients that go into making up that productivity. And they should be considered carefully because it's often our own personal sufferings that have the most to teach us about ourselves. And it does seem to me that the stimulus offered to us at university is presented in such a way that we would struggle to find elsewhere in such self-contained abundance. So there at least is you know, one justification for your head step. So back when Back when um, I was first exposed to that slide that we looked at earlier, I contacted one of my old lecturers within the chemistry, chemistry faculty and proposed the idea that he present that slide and say the value proposition within, to students within science units at the, at the start of semester. And comparatively, I'd say, he, he kind of had some uh, reservations with that idea and some hesitation and some comments on why perhaps that wasn't entirely necessary. And I've included one of them here for us to look at. So one of his comments was this. Some students are simply going through the motions because they don't know what else to do with their lives. I just... And... So, okay. Go again. So some students are simply going through the motions because they don't know what else to do with their lives. I'll tell you what, this is, this is exactly where I was when I first came to university in my first year. And it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty bad place to be because all it does really is it breeds dissatisfaction and uncertainty about what you're doing and where it is that you're going. And Looking, looking at it now, I'm not quite sure exactly what point it was that he was trying to make with this comment because to me at least it, it perfectly underlines why it's necessary or why it's important at least to be talking about the things that we are tonight. And so I had, I had, um, I had a response to this comment and I'll share it with you now. So my, my response looked like this. For those students simply wandering in a predominantly directionless manner, this kind of philosophy of, let's say, thought or value seems to me to be the perfect substitute for a current lack of vision. Because if nothing else, 
students have the framed prospect of how it is that they're improving, developing, and becoming better individuals, which is you know, something that would undoubtedly benefit them in any path that they chose to follow. And you know, perhaps the self-awareness inherent within these kinds of thoughts would stimulate the thought processes necessary to produce that path to begin with. And so the point here that I was trying to make to him was that simply exploring these ideas allows you to look at university in different ways. And as you increase the number of ways in which you perceive, in which you can perceive university, so increases the likelihood that you're going to come across some kind of value in your time here. So with that in mind, I'll, let me frame university to you like this. So think of university as an adventure of self-development, fueled by uncertainty and potential. The hope and meaning that people thrive on comes from the observation that they're moving towards something worthwhile. And if nothing else, here at university, you can be simply moving towards the fulfillment of your potential, of becoming the best version of yourself that you can possibly be, which is something that would be that is undoubtedly worthwhile. And you know, why would you not want to be looking at, at university in exactly that manner? No, I would say I'd be more than willing to say that just about everyone here is capable of more than they are currently capable of, or that they let themselves believe they are capable of. And you know, that might sound a bit convoluted, but I framed, I framed it like that specifically. Because it's the idea of who you could be, and as such, what you could be capable of, that keeps you moving forward and makes life positive and meaningful. And so it's, it's, something, it's an important thing to keep in mind, this idea that you could be capable of more. But you know, so let's say that you want to embrace that idea, you know, make, it, make it mean something to you. To do that, you may have to potentially make some changes within your life. You, know, you may have to actually start taking your future seriously. You may have to start taking yourself seriously. And part of this, part of this is realizing that the you now is responsible for the you tomorrow, and the you in a year, and the you in a decade. What you do now has consequences, positive or negative or likely both, across this time frame. But you know, to at least to at least sometimes take this thought into consideration it takes work and effort and humility, which is why I would say many of us at our age we, we don't. You know, we want to we want to have fun instead to make life life pleasurable or as easy as possible. Which you know isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world, but it does cancel out some things. And you may have to consider at some point making certain sacrifices with certain goals. You know, and you know, those goals could be anything. They could be as simple as something as simple as you know, being a better friend or having better friends, having a better relationship, having a better job, doing better, doing better at your job, being being a better worker, doing better at university, having better mental or physical health. You know, we also seem obsessed with this idea that as we grow older, life just seems to become inherently less enjoyable, as if that's something that's just like predetermined or inevitable. And you know, that really seems rather down to the person themselves, if you ask me. You know, there's plenty of things you can do in your life to make sure it loses its flair, like, you know, let's say, uh, continuing to regularly attend doolies after more than two years. What some of you here do, I know. But there's plenty of things you can do Plenty of things you can do in life to make sure life. There's plenty of things you can do in life to evolve that flair, and that's part of what comes with being a more capable person. So I would encourage you all to familiarise yourselves with the idea that you could be capable of more, you know, if you sought to be, and why perhaps that might be desirable. So I think it's safe to say that life after university will pose far more of a challenge than university itself. 
and it's going to go for much longer too. It seems reasonable to me and highly desirable to give yourself the best tools possible to meet that challenge. And you know, that there, in essence, is exactly why you are at university. That is why university exists. So I would say, explore the ideas that we've discussed within yourself tonight and see how they become a way, become a part of the way that you operate and perceive the world around you. Because once you do this, you can begin to dream not just about what job role you could fill, but about who you could be and what you could be. And that there is where life and the future becomes exciting. Thank you. seen that kind of thing presented anywhere else throughout university and after you know after two years of being here and and so it was, it was incredibly interesting I thought really really very valuable and he linked me to um, Sinek because that is where he found as I believe essentially the idea of asking this question why to begin with and Sinek, Sinek himself um, obviously poses this question why using this model in a lot of his talks and a lot of what a lot of what he talks about and it's and essentially just shows how useful of a tool it is to when when let's like looking at the nature of something or looking at the world around you. And just it was a it was, it was the best way that I could best thing that I could think of to kind of introduce this in, introduce this topic and uh, let's say ascertain the importance of asking why, like why things are, why things exist, why things are, you know, come to be, you know, for example. Do you find that those three questions are all that's necessary to gain a proper and cohesive understanding of something? Well, they're a good, they're a good starting point from, from where to, Obviously, to begin to when you when when you begin to look at look at something, so it's obviously it's not like they they themselves really provide any explanation as to anything. It's more that's it frames a way of, as I said in, at the beginning, like the, the the kind of the philosophical levels at which you can begin to observe something, which you can then build your you know then build your judgment of it through your inquiry and analysis, and. That model itself just shows, I guess, that asking the question why is the most important thing that you can do there. But it gives you, it gives you the most answers. It leads to the, the most, the more complicated questions. Does that answer? Mm -hmm. kind of yeah. Like, okay. Anyone else? Did your chemistry teacher come back to you after you presented? After this? I haven't told him about this, but I don't know, maybe, maybe I will. Um, we we talked we talked a little bit about that and after uh, after I sent him that response he what did, what did he say it was a little while ago now but he kind of he kind of just he, he didn't really see the, the whole thing as being perhaps particularly necessary or to have the kind of impact that was that was just one of the that was just one of the comments that he had at, amongst five or six or so. So um, perhaps after this I'll, um, if this recording went well, I'll send it to him and see you know, if maybe that changes his mind a little bit, but I don't think he really cared that much. Kenny? Okay. It's like you were suggesting, like a lecturer presented this to you at the start of your university experience. 
how do you think you would react? Well, I guess that that depends a lot on kind of where you are as a person at the beginning, as, as you enter university. You know, a lot of the, the reason why I found this, so one of the reasons, I guess, why, like, why I did this to begin with and why I found that slide that Jason um, presented so interesting and useful is because when I first came to university, I didn't, I didn't really know why I was here or what I was doing, and I certainly wasn't satisfied with what it was that I was doing. I was very, I was filled with uncertainty essentially, and that forced me to really think quite hard on and ask certain questions about myself and what it was that I was doing here that to, to like to, that, that led me to let's say some of the answers that we found here. And so I probably would have found that really quite stimulating and. Um, helpful, but I'd say a lot of first years, when you first come here, they're focused a lot more. It's, it's hard to, they're so uh, overwhelmed by the fact that they're at university, you know, getting like, oh, I need to do this, I need to, I need. Um, especially if they're at halls, for example, you know, so much of their lifestyle and their mental space is really consumed by them. There's that social life, and then there's the added unfamiliar, you, crushing aspect of the workload, so perhaps might have not might not have the kind of mental room. I could be wrong, of course. I'm sure I would do it. are there many first years here tonight? Okay, so really not many at all. So there you go, like <laughs> that's an answer. But no, I think to answer your question, it would have I perhaps I, I would have benefited greatly from this. I feel in my first year, and even even last year in my second year, because things hadn't changed. Things only really changed for me, at least personally, between my second year and going from ending, finishing the second year and moving into my third year. But again, that's at least why I've done this is to perhaps present these things in such a way that they might be valuable to first years in the way that I found valuable now at the the beginning and going into my third year. Does that answer? Does that really answer your question? Considering that, would you be interested in doing more talks maybe in the first years of the future? Um, I mean, <clears throat> I'd have to have something to talk about, wouldn't I? Um, like this. Yeah, I'd be more than if if this was found to have some kind of value to people, which I'm sure. You'd have, to, you'd have to probably go home first and perhaps think on this to really see how it is that you felt about it all. But if it was something that did have value to people and was found to have value, then I'd probably be more than willing to present that in such a way to first years. Because as I, kept, as I said before, I struggled a lot in my own first year to be satisfied in any way in my time here, and that affected affected my uni performance and just just my lifestyle in general. So yeah. How do you reckon we as uni students can develop our emotional maturity like we can study to increase our intellectual maturity? What would the study sort of be for emotional maturity for you? Well of of course Emotional stimulus is heavily, heavily brought about by uh, social interaction. You know, putting yourself in environments where that cause an emotional, an emotional reaction. But I think, as I mentioned before in that slide, developing, developing emotionally, emotional maturity, probably the, the, the most powerful tool you can use in that regard is is self-reflection, is truly is withdrawing into your own mind and seeing, looking, essentially shining a, shining a bright light on yourself and your thoughts and your feelings and your actions and what's happened in the past to, to essentially to self-analyze and to critique and to, to criticize because what that does, it, 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 
it shows you it, it, it shows you who you are as as a person. It shows you what you're made of, and it also shows you what other people are made of as well. It, it informs you on. It informs you because we're often actually so similar in the way that we think and we feel, especially in the way we act in certain situations. And you can kind of extrapolate that information out from other people and from yourself and apply it to and apply it to other people. And that, that, that then informs you and it, 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 it just it educates you as such. And that's, in my opinion, being self, the equivalent of like studying, studying a book. And obviously you can study, there's certain, certain academic fields you can certainly study to perhaps increase your emotional uh, intelligence or perception or comp confidence, whatever that, you know, that might mean. But I think in terms of developing like a, an emotional framework, for example, a stable emotional framework, the best thing for that is, is being self-aware and reflecting, deep, deeply reflecting on like, why it is that you, you know, why it is that you've been feeling certain ways and then what's, for example, you know, what's led to those things and then what's come of those things and, and asking yourself, you know, whether or not those things, for example, are, are, are optimal even to begin with. And then you then make decisions about that, you work with that information and perhaps change the way that you behave and, and then you see how that, how that goes and you just, it's like, it's like in a, a continuous learning process on who you are. And I'd say that's, a, that's one of the strongest, the best ways of becoming emotionally mature. Is putting, is because what you do when you do that is, especially when you reflect deeply into your own mind, and you, you look at you look at you look at the hardest parts of yourself, you know, your your flaws and your and your weaknesses. That you shine you shine a bright light on them. That that's what really ends up building, I would say, like a strong strong character, a strong self understanding, a very strong, a stable emotional framework. Yeah. Yes, Kisa. Um, how did you go about the process of sort of? Uh, Um, and then sort of uh, starting to develop the habit that would be more consistent with this new way of thinking. That's a good question. So, so I would say if it's using <coughs> to explore that, so transitioning from let's say last year to this year. I well first first off I was beginning to uh, expose myself to certain uh, certain modes of like intellectual uh, thought, philosophical thought, psychological thought, sociological thought. You know, better understanding the things that uh, affect us and make up who we are as people and affect the way that we think, we feel, and so that educated me a lot. On who I, you know, who I was as a person, who other people are, and why, why you might come to be that way, and and what, what I did when I what what, what that process st uh, invoked, I would say, is that as I was just saying earlier, a lot of self reflection about myself and about who I was as a person and what I what I perhaps might want to be uh, instead going forward, and so essentially. What I did, what I did is I found, I found some kind of value, some, some something that was valuable to me personally, which was this uh, a process of essentially like writing like this, contemplative. I found something that I, that was valuable and had meaning to me, and I felt like could be, could have value to the world outside, and it gave me a sense of kind of uh, security or self self peace, and. I developed that, and whilst I was doing that, I was reflecting a lot on myself and who I was, and perhaps what I wanted to change going into the future. And I felt, I felt, what that did is that led to a sense of uh, a, satis a satisfaction with what it was that that I was doing, which then allowed me to think a lot more clearly and let and let go of some of the. You know, find value in other things in life besides, let's say, going out and like it, like it halls, going out and drinking, 
getting absolutely hammered like once or twice, even twice or twice a week, pretty standard. Which really was, it was, it was, it's fun, but it was kind. Of, it was acting as like a, a disguise for the fact that I was quite dissatisfied with what it was and how my life was going at the time in certain, in certain areas. And so I'd say what I did was I, just, I found some kind of value outside of, outside of that lifestyle. So I found reasons to appreciate, let's say just appreciate the present more and what it was that I was doing um, at this time. Reasons like like this to why, why, why university was perhaps more valuable than I might have thought, even though I might have been a bit dissatisfied with what it was that I was doing. Which is why, again, one of the reasons why I've done this tonight, I came up with this talk, was to provide reasons for the people here, everyone here, why perhaps, just one second, why perhaps you might be able to find more value in university than you previously have, and to, to allow you to better enjoy your time here to give yourself a bit more, a bit more certainty, a bit more peace. Do you feel like how you're talking about sort of being able to bring this to sort of first year students? Uh, do you feel that uh, sort of two things? If that was sort of pitched to you first thing that you went into a lecture hall, would that have changed your experience? And second, is it not possibly a process that for you to get to where you've got to, you kind of have to go through? the stages to get to that emotional maturity to understand that for it to yeah. actually take Yeah, so I think that to, yeah, so for, the, for first years in particular, for your first year of university, I think it's important that they go through that, they go through the process themselves a little bit, like at least for like a semester or so to see, to see how it is that they actually feel about the time that they spent here and what it is that they like, what it is that they don't like, and um, how the whole kind of process relates to the, 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 the present and then their future, and then why perhaps. Because you have to eat. I'd say with this is you have to have it's it's going to be more receptive if you're going to be you're going to be able to get more out of it if you have a reason to potentially get more out of it. If you've just come into university, you don't actually know anything, you're working from a, like a blank slate, you don't really know anything yourself of what, to, what, what you're working with or what you're going to be experiencing. But once you've spent some time here, you know, you've been through the motions a little bit, and then you can, that allows you to, you know, you, to perhaps come up with certain thoughts on your own. Or if anything, then, you know, to, to, to see, yourself what, what it is that I might be talking about in terms of some kind of like value in the things that you find here. If you've already come across those things yourself, then instead of simply this simply presenting that to you as a as a potential, that it'll, it'll be reinforcing those things. Or you know, it'll be articulating concerns or idea concerns that you might have but you just have to know how to, to phrase properly. So and once you once you've articulated the the thing that's so important, I'd say, about listening to other people talk about things that you thought about is that they might be able to frame it in such a way that you haven't been able to. And once, and if, once they do that, if that thought is then clearly articulated for you, even when more it's been more of a sense of an intuition or just a feeling, you can then begin to, you know what it is actually that you're thinking when you feel it, you can then obviously begin to do something about that, a bit more effectively, productive with other things. So in answering that, it, you, you might be kind of pushing against just a, a, a plain barrier a little bit if you're presenting to you students that have just entered university. But I'd say so for those that have been here for a little bit, for a semester at least, then that's perhaps you know perhaps a bit more of a better option. There was something that I was thinking about coming into this, whether or not whether you know what year level would get the most out of this, whether it be a third year or above or a second year or first year. But you know, I wasn't, I wasn't sure. So I think that's, unless anyone else has another question, that's just about it for tonight. So thank you again, guys, very much for coming. I truly appreciate that you decided to spend part of your Tuesday evening here. And I really do hope that 
there was at least something here tonight that you gained some kind of uh, some kind of value from that you can take away and employ in the way that you move forward and travel throughout the university. Did you have something you wanted to say, Jason? I think we can all agree that Lucian has done something very special. He's a student just like all of you. And yet, think about the clarity of thought, the trouble that he went through. He's not earning any extra marks to do this. And to me, um, it, 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 it speaks of really incredible growth. And I, I really like what you see mentioned where he, he juxtaposed um, the start that we be in university. So we, we have staff members who are all human, just like you know, speaking very honestly. How we do our job is grounded in many, many different reasons. So, and, and they're just as diverse as to why you are here to So the reason why I do my job is because after a career in banking finance, after running my own business, which is, which is dirty, which is, uh, I've got worried about people cheating on me and, and, and looking to watch out for the worst possible impulses that people have in the business. My work as a captain here is to help our young people be smarter. It's one of the best things I can do. And when I can see that the results of, of, of some of our efforts, you see how much loose has grown. Uh, just as a person, um, I, I don't think I can do anything better. So sometimes in, in, in the first unit that I run, all my staff, we're fortunate enough to be able to say to the board of students, we are here for you. And that automatically sets uh, an orientation direction of the unit that is different. But university, and you will see that in so many different units, you'll encounter sometimes staff members whose primary objective is their research, and they just want to get this over and done with as fast as possible. University, and, and like anything else, it's like any other organization you go to work at in the future. You know, you'll have good ones and you'll have bad ones. And they're there for different reasons. So, the, the experience that you have to start isn't just this monolithic, uh, simplistic, uh, that's the way it is, and, and, and that, that's all there is. There are many reasons which again stem from why we're doing this job in the first place. So when you think about you know, the faculty members and staff that we meet, you know, there are many different reasons which affect why they, how they deliver the institute, how they act the way that they are. So uh, I just want to. Uh, Shout out to Lucy. Recognize uh, what what an amazing thing he's done here, um, and I hope. And, and I see my objective uh, is to do whatever I can to, to, to help support him in sharing his message and, and his articulation of value. Uh, at so once again, let's let's give Lucy a round. Again, thanks guys, thanks for coming. Um, obviously that's the end, you're free to go now, but I hope this was worthwhile in some way and I'm sure I'll see most of you around at the university. Cheers. Thank you.